We continue our series in the book of Psalms, and we've been looking at various themes, and there's two weeks left, this week and next, and the last three weeks, we've hit on a triad of themes that are interrelated, suffering, guilt, and now enemies. So happy Father's Day, a sermon about enemies. All these themes are themes where the psalmist cries out to God amidst the despair that he feels. And so today's scripture is Psalm 3, but I've included portions of Psalm 2, actually all of Psalm 2, but I'll read the first half, because to rightly understand the psalmist's confidence amidst his complaint in Psalm 3, we need to understand Psalm 2. This is the word of the Lord from Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. In Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. This is the word of the Lord. So when tasked with preaching on enemies on Father's Day, a quote came to mind from a series of movies that you probably are familiar with, maybe. But the Godfather movies, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. That's what came to mind. And there's so many quotes from from those movies And a number of them are applicable today, like, for instance, never hate your enemies, it affects your judgment. And isn't that good advice? And if you don't know those, hopefully you know this one. Don't ever take sides with anyone against the family. And that's just a good one. The Godfather series of movies is such a uh, masterful storytelling. It's captivated Hearts because of the themes of betrayal and deception, family dynamics and intrigue, concept of family, friends, and enemies. And as I think of of those series, I think they have nothing on the story of the life of David. We come to Psalm 3 today, and it says, a psalm of David when he's fleeing from his son Absalom. David is on the run. He's been king for 20 years long since the days of him defeating Goliath and him fighting the Philistines. The Davidic covenant, God's promise to David, has already been given to him a long time ago. We read that in poetic form in Psalm 2. Nathan is gone, his prophet, the advisor. He's already sinned with Bathsheba. This story finds David in exile, yet he ends up victorious And yet it doesn't have the glory of the story of David and Goliath. It's a tragic story, yet without the intrigue for us of David sinning with Bathsheba, the story begins with a quarrel between siblings. Amnon, David's oldest son, is lusting after his half-sister Tamar, and he tricks her into coming to him, and he will rape her. David will be infuriated by this, but do nothing about it. So his other son, Absalom, who is a full brother to Tamar, decides to take justice into his own hands. And he has Amnon killed. 
Now, even though Absalom is the king's son, you don't get away with killing the king's son. And so Absalom will go into exile for three years. David is convinced to allow him to come back, but for two more years, David won't see him. And this is when Absalom plots his revenge for the loss of love of his father. The feeling of betrayal and of having enemies torments us. It's a tension that affects our health and our well-being. We feel alone. We feel fear further loss. We feel helpless and hopeless. We want someone to listen. We want a defender. We want a dad who will make things right. In Psalm 3, we see David crying out to the Lord amidst great suffering at the hands of enemies, but not just enemies, people closest to him, as we'll see, more than just Absalom. But he cries out to God in confidence, based on Psalm 2, where God himself establishes his covenant with a Davidic king to be a father to him, and by extension, to the people that the king represents. God's covenant faithfulness to his people, his hesed, as we've been learning in these psalms, is that of a father to a son, to a child. And as a father loves his children, he wants his own to call out to him in honesty and in faith. So let's see how to cry out to God, and we'll use the pattern of this psalm, because every two verses of this psalm represents a section. And so first, the the psalmist brings his complaint, Verses 1 and 2. Verses 3 and 4, he expresses his confidence. In verses 5 and 6, he shows comfort. And then 7 and 8 kind of summarize those themes. And so we'll look at the complaint found in Psalm 3's story, David's confidence in the author of the big story, and his comfort in the gospel. That is the anti-story. And so first, David's complaint behind Psalm 3's story. We see it in verses 1 and 2, how many are my foes, many are rising against me, many are saying of my soul. If you jump to verse 6, many thousands of people, it's many, it's many. It's, the re- repetition of the word many is, is, is indicating it's increasing, and he feels the weight pressing down on him. And besides the many people that are against him, it's how they're doing it that is tormenting David. He says, many are saying of my soul there is no salvation for him in God. They're taunting him. So there's many people, they're taunting him, they've risen against him. We know that the rebellion starts with Absalom and David with such a love and concern for his people and for God's holy hill set up on Jerusalem he decides to leave Jerusalem on his own. He doesn't want the city to be destroyed in war, and so he heads out, and those loyal to him will follow. And what he sees is the priest ends up taking the Ark of the Covenant, and they're about to take it out of the city. And David said, no, God had established that in his city. That is not to leave. I may be in exile, and maybe God will bring me back to it, but that stays where it is. And on his way out, in 2 Samuel, you can read this in chapters 13 to 20 or 21, you could read this whole uh, account. He comes across enemy after enemy that just keeps adding insult to injury. And so on his way out, he learns that his closest advisor, probably his best friend, Ahithophel, had joined Absalom. This torments David, as we can read in Psalm 55. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. And so it's a a blow that compounds the problem for David. It's his son. It's his closest friend. He'll come across other people, like people from Saul's house that are throwing rocks at him and hurling curses at him. And then he comes across Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth was Saul's son, the king before David. And David has shown such great kindness and mercy to him. Gave him everything that had belonged to Saul and allowed this young man to eat at his own very own table. And he learns, I believe incorrectly, but he learns that Mephibosheth has also turned against him. 
The feeling and experience of betrayal uh, runs so deep when it's somebody you love, when it's family and when it's friends. It's one thing to have people that we view as enemies out in the world. It's another when it hits close to home. And in those moments, where can we turn? And we see that David turns to God in response to his enemies. He cries out to God. And he does so on the basis of Psalm 2. Yahweh said to me, you are my son. Today I have become a father to you. Ask of me. And so in Psalm 3, he does. Verse 4, I cried out to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. Verse 7, arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. Enemies have risen against David and David calls out to his father God, arise. They've risen, now you rise. He does so in remarkable honesty, doesn't he? And if you are a reader of the Psalms, you see that David gets even more honest than that. See, we don't need to sanitize our prayers before the Lord. He wants our hearts. He wants us to cry out to him. But yet somehow we try to pretty up our cares and our prayers. I, I think of my own self and my own frustrations, or maybe I'm working in the garage and things aren't working the way, and I hope my kids are not around and I'm just, you know, what I'm saying. <laughs> and then I realize I got to repent, and then I come to the Lord. Dear Lord, teach me patience. And just, just sanitized. God doesn't need our sanitized prayers. He's our father. It's like when our kids come to us. Do we, do we really need them to come to us in a sanitized way or do we want to hear their hearts? Cry out to God. Where are you? Does that bother you? Read the Psalms. You'll, it'll bother you even more. And this crying out in honesty before his father is met with confidence in who the father is. And that's the second part of the sermon. The confidence... David's confidence in the author of the big story. And I have five things that he's confident in, and so I figured out a way to fi fit in the number five. I like the number five. I was given grief to having a five-point sermon, so I gave you a three-point sermon, but the middle point has five of its own sub-points. Enjoy. They'll be quick, the first four anyway. Confidence, David's confidence is based on comparison first. He compares the many, the many, the many, and then you see verse 3, but you, learn to love that word in the Bible, B-U-T. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. See, it doesn't matter how many thousands are aligned against him, and it was thousands, because they don't compare to God. It's like what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who's going to bring a charge if God's for you? Peter says in John chapter 6, where would we go, Lord? You alone have the words of eternal life. There's nowhere else. There's nothing that compares. So based on the comparison of all these adversaries, David is confident in his Father in heaven. Verse 7, he's confident in, based on past provision. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek, you break the teeth of the wicked. It's in the past tense. He's referring to all the past times God's had gotten him out of jams. Based on God's past provision, David has confidence in his future uh, protection. The third reason, confidence in the sovereignty of God. It's verse 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He's fully confident that the nations can rage, but God will laugh. He's in control. Salvation belongs to him. And in that, he's confident in God's justice. Again, we see that in the striking of the enemies. And there's a category of psalms called imprecatory psalms. This is not generally categorized as one of them, although it does call down judgment on David's enemies. But that just means psalms of cursing, and you see sometimes they get pretty graphic. When the psalmist calls down God's judgment on enemies of God or his people or his anointed one, which is the representative of God. You know, it's poetry, but the graphic nature of the metaphor and hyperbole is sometimes difficult to our ears. I read this psalm to my kids this week. I typically do that when I preach. I read what I'm going to preach to them. And, and in the explanation and discussion, I brushed over the, this part. 
And then Ariel, right as I was like, okay, so let's pray. And Ariel says, wait a minute, daddy. What about, what does that mean? The breaking of the teeth. <laughs> I said, well, honey, these are enemies of God and God's anointed and God's people. And David is calling down God's righteous judgment on them. But that's difficult to understand. So let's look at David's actions because actions speak louder than words. And so what does David do in this very same situation where he's calling down judgment on his enemies? How, how does he respond to them? What does he do? And we can see that in 2 Samuel 16. When Shimei is throwing rocks at David, cursing at him as David walks out in shame. People that are with David are incensed. So then Abishai, the son of Zariah, said to the king, why should this dead dog curse the Lord, the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, curse David, who then shall say, why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more should this Benjamite? Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. Now, it would make sense for David to kill this guy and actually to kill everybody he meets leaving the city, anybody who's in the rebellion, but he, he doesn't because he's confident in the sovereignty of of God and God's justice. Now, when you see David walk back into the city after, he, uh, after Absalom is defeated, he comes across the same sort of pattern. He comes back across the same guy. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan and said to the king, let not my Lord hold me guilty or remember how your servant did wrong on the day my Lord, the king, left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart, for your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, to come down to meet my lord, the king. And so he pleads, and he repents, and he says, I know I've sinned. Well, the same guys that want to kill him before want to kill him again. This is what David says. So shall, anybody, shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? And the king said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. And so David extends him mercy. See, regardless of what David writes, and it is right to call down God's justice upon evil and those doing evil, but he doesn't carry out personal vendettas. He doesn't carry out his own retribution. There is no retribution ethic in the Bible, even in the Old Testament. So even though David is God's instrument of justice on earth, he didn't carry out those vendettas. And like, too, like David, we too should rest in the fact that vengeance belongs to the Lord. A verse in the Old Testament that is quoted in the New. But really, the main thing David is confident in, it's your fifth point in there, is he's confident in the covenant, God's covenant, as part of the big story. See, David understands that he is a part of a big story that has always involved enemies. We see it. Creation is made. God makes, creates all things. He makes it good. The serpent comes in, the enemy of God, and he turns his children, Adam and Eve, against God. So now they're enemies of God. God says this to the serpent, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise your heel. And it sets the pattern out. And it's one thing when enemies are abroad, when we fight other nations, when, when there's other countries, when they're strangers, but what we've always seen in the word of God is that it's brother against brother, family member against family member. Right after Adam and Eve, there's Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel, brothers. Fast forward, Jacob and Esau, they're at war with each other. Joseph's brothers sell Joseph into slavery. Miriam and Aaron turn against their brother Moses. All the tribes of Israel are kind of warring against each other in the book of Judges until God establishes his king. It's supposed to be a reset, really. We could see that if we look at the big story. Just like Adam was installed in the garden to be God's representative to keep and tend the garden, God establishes the, David, his Davidic king, and gives him his covenant to keep... <laughs> 
the new garden, Jerusalem. And just like Adam falls in the garden by seeing that the fruit was good to the eyes, by taking of the fruit and by eating of it, it says David sees that Bathsheba is beautiful to the eyes. It says he takes her and he sins with her. And just like Adam and Eve had two sons quarreling and Cain killing Abel, so David has two sons quarreling and Absalom kills Amnon. And just like Adam was exiled from the garden, David now is in exile from the new garden, Jerusalem. And so the pattern of sin repeats itself and it grieves David and we know it grieves David because we could read things like Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence. It grieves David. And then we see just the the ripple effects of sin and that's what it is. It's a cycle. Look at David's sons. Just as David repeats the sins of Adam... Amnon lusts after and rapes Tamar, just like David lusted after and raped Bathsheba. Absalom has Amnon killed through a deceitful story, just like David has Uriah killed through a deceitful story. Absalom sins on the rooftop with David's wives. It's the very same rooftop that David first lusted after Bathsheba. We have a seemingly endless cycle of sin, which is the real enemy here. Because, of course, brother can and will rise against brother and father against son and vice versa. And people do horrible things to each other. Nobody is exempt. Sin is the real enemy. Because why do we have physical enemies anyway? Because of sin. Why would we be told to love one another? It's because we don't. (laughs) And that's because of sin. But rather than despair, David knows that one day this will all be cleaned up. Based on that covenant, again, we see in Psalm 2, there will, be co- there will come another king from the line of David. David's descendant, the greater son of David, the final Davi- Davidic king, the new and greater Adam, will rule and put all his enemies and ours under his feet, including sin and death. And that brings David great comfort. And so David's comfort in the gospel That is the anti-story. And that's not a word I made up. That's that's a word used in literature. It's when a story doesn't follow the normal conventions of its genre. It breaks the rules. It does so recklessly. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for David to be comfortable despite his circumstances. Verse 5, I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. Can you sleep if people were out to kill you? He's sleeping. I think this refers back in that Second Samuel account. There's a point where they're camped and then somebody warns David, you can't camp here this night and it saves them. And so they leave that area and they go somewhere else. And I think David here is saying, and I laid down and slept and look at that, I woke up. Expressing comfort. Humanly speaking, it doesn't compare to reality. But this is what the gospel does. It breaks the rules. And do you notice that nobody is getting what they deserve in this story? It's reckless. Why would David, why should he get the kingdom back? His sins far out exceed Saul's sins, humanly speaking. Yet he gets the kingdom back. David doesn't retaliate against his enemies, not on the way out of the city and not on the way into the city. It breaks the rules. He doesn't want Absalom killed. You say, well, it's his son. Yeah, look back into history and antiquity when sons rise up against fathers what do they do if you even looked at herod cross-eyed he had you killed if you were his son they said the most dangerous thing to be would be to be herod's son david doesn't give uh, justice or judgment he doesn't bring judgment on amnon or absalom and maybe it's because david realizes that he too is a rapist and a murderer the problem is he gives mercy without justice. And we see that's a tension that we're always trying to navigate in dads and parents. Don't we, don't we try to navigate that? When to be disciplinarians and when to show love and mercy and how, how, to, how to balance those things. We see David was given great mercy and when he extends mercy, he somehow seems to do it without relationship. That in and of itself is its own judgment, isn't it? Mercy without relationship. He almost lost the kingdom for doing that, so he pardons Absalom, but he doesn't give him love, so Absalom says, I'll take over. 
David ends up paying the price, doesn't he? See, justice is only obtained if a debt is paid, and mercy is only obtained if a debt is forgiven. How do you get both? How can you pay a debt and forgive a debt? We're always trying to figure that out, but it can only happen in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's going to happen in somebody who is in a position to pay the debt on the behalf of somebody else. See, sinners have nothing to present to God. You can't say, well, let me do, it's filthy rags. We're, we're already sinners before a holy God, but yet Jesus Christ, perfectly sinless. Christ who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. TJ talked about this imputation. It's the great exchange. Jesus who's sinless gets our sin applied to him and pays the judgment so that we who are sinful wear his pure white clothes. Righteousness. Thank God we don't get what we deserve. David doesn't get what he deserved. If it's based on karma, God shouldn't be hearing David's prayers. You know, Absalom cried out to David a number of times. David was not, uh, would not see him until Absalom finally burned down the general's field to get his father's attention. Yet when David goes to God, his father, he fully expects to be heard based again on Psalm 2. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, Psalm 3. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me. God's not giving David what he deserves. David won't hear his own son out, but yet God will hear his child because he's the perfect father. The Bible knows this is an anti-story. Paul tells us that he came preaching Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Greeks because a crucified Messiah is not a savior. He's dead in the world's economy. But not so with the greater David, the greater son of David. This whole story of David points to the final Davidic king, Jesus Christ. It's the one that David looked to in his failures. We see that in another son. The Lord said to my Lord. David talking about God. See, David willingly leaves his palace and goes into the wilderness. And the book of Philippians tells us that Jesus did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. He leaves heaven. He comes into our wilderness existence. When David leaves Jerusalem, it says he goes across the brook Kidron into the Mount of Olives. Those places are not mentioned all that often in the Old Testament, but we hear about them all the time in the New Testament because that was Jesus' usual, usual path. And the last time Jesus will leave Jerusalem, it says he crosses the brook Kidron, goes into the Mount of Olives, which is where the Garden of Gethsemane is. And that's where Jesus' closest friend and advisor, Judas, will betray him like Ahithophel did to David. When David went across in his walk of shame, people throwing things at him, cursing him. These are the same people, by the way, that said, Saul had killed his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Make him king. Now they're throwing stuff at him. Reminds us of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, triumphantly initially. Son of David, they called him. Same people said, crucify him, spit on him. David puts to rest his rebellion by forgiving those who repent of their sin and pleading on his mercy. Jesus Christ puts to death our rebellion by his own sacrifice on the cross applied to anybody who would receive it in repentant faith. David sits back on the throne and his enemies bow down to him and Jesus Christ is on the throne and one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord but Jesus doesn't do this with a physical sword, but with his word and his love and his sacrifice. He is a suffering Messiah. He conquers by becoming a servant. It's an antistory. It's reckless. He puts to death our enemies, the real enemies that we have, sin and death. In 1 Corinthians, I read a part of it already. Paul goes on. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. So that no human being may boast in the presence of God. 
And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. It's an upside-down kingdom where God uses what is foolish to shame the wise, where the last are first, the poor are rich, the weak are strong. It's the gospel where the reckless love of the Father sends his son to die for his enemies, you and me, so that we can have peace with God as we declared in Romans 5 earlier in the service. But not only that, so that we can call him Father as the greater son of David, Jesus Christ, tells us to call him. And if you're in Christ, you begin to understand what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, what we think are our enemies, but against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. That's our, those are our enemies. And we get that this Anta story becomes our story, and once we were enemies of God, alienated from him and at war with him, we can then, like David leave the judgment of our physical enemies up to God. And even more reckless than that, we can actually, as Christ tells us, to love our enemies and pray for them. Who knows? Somebody might be praying for you right now. Some Father's Day thoughts from this cheerful story. And, you know, these holidays, Mother's Day and Father's Day, it's... Um, they're always difficult because we love our earthly fathers and yet sometimes we're estranged from our earthly fathers. And so how do you process stuff like this? And people, when they usually teach about David, very often they teach very moralistically about him. Be like David. Slay your giants. Just pick up a few little pebbles. That's so simplistic. David has successes but he had monumental failures. So I ask you, if David couldn't be like David when you tell people to be like David, then how are we telling other people to be like David in his successes or his failures? David loses four sons. When Absalom dies, he wails famously, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I have died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. He had deep love for his kids yet he couldn't bring himself to discipline them. And when he granted mercy, it was without relationship. Now, I tell you that not to tell you so don't be like David in his failures because that too is too simplistic as telling you to be like him in his successes. Life is more than mere comp uh, emulation in successes and failures. Balancing mercy and justice, love and law is complex stuff. And what is right in these situations often doesn't translate to the next. I think I mess it up more than I get it right with my wife, with my kids, with those I love. So for me, men, on this Father's Day, David's successes and failures aside, I want to be a father and a dad and a husband, a son, a brother, a friend, who is not too proud to cry out to God like David, to repent like David, and to have the full assurance like David that salvation belongs to the Lord regardless of the outcomes and successes and failures. And knowing that, that no matter how much I mess up with my kids, that God is more of a father to them than I ever will be and that he loves them more than I ever possibly can. He is in control. And confidence in that comforts me regardless of my failings. If you haven't claimed the reckless love of God as your own through faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his son, would you do so today? You will always be able to remember that on 2018, on Father's Day, is the day that you stop being an enemy of God and you can call him Father. He's no longer your enemy. Let's pray.